Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ICD-10 webinar. This is being brought to you by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. My name is Renee Richard, and I'm a health insurance specialist in the CMS Boston Regional Office. And today I'll be presenting the on, on ICD-10. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session where you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Representatives from the CMS Central Office will be on the line to help answer any questions that we have. After the Q&A session, you'll also have an opportunity to download the slides from today's webinar. So we will get started. We'll begin on slide one. We would like to provide you with an overview of the ICD-10 impact and progress made to date and discuss resources that are available to assist you as you prepare for ICD-10. First, I will talk about some of the um, ICD-10 basics. What is ICD-10, why and matters, and what are the opportunities of compliance with ICD-10 and the risks of non-compliance? ICD-10 replaces the ICD-9 code sets and includes updated medical terminology and classification of diseases. ICD-10 refers to the diagnosis and procedure code sets and consists of two parts, the CM and the PCS. ICD-10 CM is, used, is for use in all U.S. healthcare settings. The ICD-10 procedure code sets is for use in U.S. inpatient hospital settings only. All organizations covered by HIPAA must use ICD-10 to code healthcare services provided on October 1st, 2014. The compliance date is firm and we are moving ahead to prepare for the transition. What is ICD-10? The World Health Organization originally developed the ICD-9 code set. The National Center for Health Statistics developed the ICD-9 clinical modification codes for the United States in the 1970s to assign codes attributed to inpatient, outpatient, and physician care. ICD-10-CM is the diagnosis code set that will be replacing ICD-9-CM volumes 1 and 2. ICD-10-CM will be used to report diagnosis in all, all clinical settings. ICD-10 procedure code sets will be used to report hospital inpatient procedures only. The current procedural terminology, or CPTs, and Healthcare Common Procedure Coding Systems, or HCPCS, will continue to be used to report services and procedures in outpatient and office settings. ICD-10 provides much more granular information and will enhance the ability to better manage care, track health outcomes, enhance quality of care, and robust data analytics. The conversion to ICD-10 is a HIPAA code set requirement. All HIPAA covered entities must have ICD-10 codes for information they transmit electronically. As mentioned earlier, the compliance date of October 1st, 2014 is firm. Why ICD-10 matters? ICD-10 is essential to healthcare reform and it is part of the overall goal to achieve better care, better health at lower cost. The ICD-10 code set reflects advances in medicine and uses current medical terminology. The code format is expanded, which means that it has the ability to include greater detail within the code. The greater detail means that the code can provide more specific information about the diagnosis. The ICD-10 code set is also more flexible for expansion and includes new technologies and diagnoses. The ICD-9 code set is over 30 old and, old and has become outdated. It is no longer considered usable for today's treatment, reporting, and payment processes. It does not reflect advances in medical technology and knowledge. ICD-10 is more effective at capturing public health diseases 
due to its greater specificity. Federal, state, and local officials, officials excuse me, including researchers, will use ICD-10 diagnosis codes for public health research, reporting, and surveillance. I'm now on a slide that's entitled ICD-10 Compliance, and what we have is two message boxes giving you information regarding the opportunities for compliance and the risks of noncompliance. ICD-10 offers significant opportunities to improve payment and claims processing, and ICD-10 is foundational to healthcare reform and the achievement of better care, better health, and lower costs. It also enhances fraud, waste, abuse, prevention, and detection. The risks of noncompliance with ICD-10 include incorrect or slow claims payment, penalties, and disruption in analytics and research. And we actually, as I say, will provide a little more detail regarding that information on the slide. Next, I want to provide you with an industry update on progress toward ICD-10 implementation and focus on approaches that can assist you in successfully running ICD-10. The next slide is entitled CMS ICD-10 Implementation Today. Medicare and state Medicaid agencies are on track for the October 1st 2014 ICD-10 implementation date. Medicare programs are approximately 68% complete and the system updates are approximately 75% complete. CMS is conducting quarterly assessments with the state Medicaid agencies to track their progress toward ICD-10 implementation. Large practices, clearinghouses, and many payers are on track for ICD-10. The, the, the small physician practices need additional technical assistance. CMS is also working with the small physician practices to offer education and technical support to help them prepare for the ICD-10 implementation. CMS is engaging in conversations with vendors and discussing next steps on how vendors can work together with their customers to get ready for ICD-10. And on this slide, we give an update regarding Medicare implementation, state Medicaid agencies, providers, as well as vendors. Our next slide is entitled CMS ICD-10 Project Management Office Approach. On this slide, CMS has a comprehensive implementation based on an impact analysis, solution concept, implementation and monitoring plans, and project schedules. The ICD-10 implementation is guided by an e-health steering committee made up of CMS executives, policy, technical, and system staff. 19 key project areas were identified with 52 projects supporting the larger project areas in monitoring of systems. There is also a bi-weekly governance board and a weekly monitoring and planning meeting. The next slide is regarding CMS ICD-10 reporting structure. Project input is obtained every two weeks and the project data are updated to incorporate this new input to track and communicate risk to the project management office. The Project man Management Office takes that information and updates the master schedule and creates program dashboards that are used to inform the steering committee about the ICD-10 implementation project's progress. And this slide um, highlights that process that we are using internally at CMS. Next, I would like to review with you the impact that ICD-10 has on the provider community as well as the healthcare industry as a whole. I also will review some practical step-by-step -step actions that providers can take to prepare for ICD-10. Our next slide is entitled ICD-10 Impact Across the Industry. And shown on this screen is a focus and a diagram of how each area in a practice or hospital will be affected. 
the ICD-10 impact affects many areas and organizations across healthcare and financial sectors. For instance, with payers, ICD-10 impacts health plans because the claims may alter coverage and reimbursement. ICD-10 expands the number of available codes, requiring organizations to evaluate codes and determine what the organization will pay for certain benefits. Codes are used to determine whether services are covered, simulation, and trigger business rules within the payer systems. Sometimes payers are subject to claim process reviews. Payers are responsible for notifying external parties of when and how the payer is converting from ICD-9 to ICD-10. Let's talk a bit about how this affects healthcare payers and clearinghouses. The shift to ICD-10 will also require software modifications in both the insurance coverage and billing sections of practice management systems. Billing services and clearinghouse vendors will also have to comply with the new system. Providers. Providers use ICD-10 codes to code, submit, and process claims accurately at clearinghouses. Patient member beneficiary. Co-payments are tied to codes that determine the nature of the service. Payment members and beneficiaries. Co-payments are tied to codes that determine the nature of the service. I am now, if we get um, our system back, I am now on slide 13. ICD-10 timeline for providers and payers. CMS has created timelines for different provider groups and pairs to provide a visual guide of the key transition activities by phase and the estimated time frames for each activity. These timelines are available on the CMS ICD-10 website, which is, which is www.cms.gov backslash ICD-10. April through December 2013, Providers and payers should conduct ICD-10 internal testing within their organizations. Providers and payers should allow a full year for testing with one another and with other business trading partners, and this testing should occur between October 2013 through October 2014. Our next slide is entitled ICD-10 and physician practices. Again, here we give a diagram of each of the areas that will be affected um, by this implementation. We highlight it with how it is physicians, clinical staff, managers, front desk folks, coding, billing, as well as our labs. ICD-10 will impact all aspects of your practice from the front desk to nursing documentation to the clinical areas and physician office, to the manager's office, to billing and coding. As you can see, it will affect all areas of business. ICD-10 has an impact on people, process, and technology. Slide, for, for, um, excuse me, slide 15, what should you do to prepare? As applicable, Ask if the necessary software updates will be installed with your upgrades for the version 5010 HIPAA transaction. If you do not use the HIPAA transactions, determine when they will have your software updates available and then when they will be installed in your system. Determine when clearinghouses, billing service pay and payers will have their ICD-10 upgrades completed and when you can begin testing with them. Identify changes needed to convert to ICD-10 code set, such as with your diagnosis coding tools or super, super bills or public health reporting tools, etc. Attend implementation training. CMS and its regional office, as well as the EHR regional extension centers, will be offering several training sessions on ICD-10 implementation. External testing conduct, conducted October 2013 through September 30th, 2014. We have some links available on the slide that will take you to the HIM SSS ICD-10 playbook 
and a list of vendor questions. Next, we're going to talk about resources. I want to provide you with information on a variety of resources that are available to you to support your ICD-10 implementation. We'll first talk about state Medicaid agencies and the ICD-10 implementation. The state Medicaid agencies have a number of ongoing activities to monitor progress toward ICD-10 implementation and training, training and support to the states. Our next slide is entitled, Working with the State Medicaid Agencies, and we have highlighted um, a number of topics that we're working with state Medicaid, CMS is working with state Medicaid agencies. The state Medicaid agencies have engaged in a variety of activities, including providing online and live educational information and establishing a forum for collaboration. The state Medicaid agencies, ICD-10 implementation handbooks, and site visits have been well received by the states. As I mentioned, the ICD-10 implementation handbook mm -hmm. is an online tool providing SMA-specific information to assist in ICD-10 implementation. We also have health condition categories, a foundation for SM SMAs to define health conditions in alignment with the needs of their specific agency. There are quarterly online ICD-10 self-assessments, as well as a state ICD-10 collaboration site, which we'll highlight in a second. There are also policy briefs. The four, first four policy briefs that are shown on the slide are complete and have been shared with the state Medicaid agencies. There are also five other policy briefs that are being developed. Each policy brief provides an in-depth look at a specific condition or topic and examines how the change to ICD-10 coding will impact state Medicaid agency programs for that condition. The policy brief ties in and in other healthcare initiatives that the states will need to address in addition to ICD-10. Health condition mapping will be finalized later this year and we will highlight a little bit more of this detail on our next slide, which again, I apologize that you can't see. The next slide is entitled Medscape Modules on ICD-10. CMS is working with Medscape and has developed several modules and articles around ICD-10 implementation. These materials provide useful tips on how to get started and move through the various ICD-10 implementation stages. The training is offered to everyone. In fact, physicians can earn CME credits for taking the training. About 16,000 people are taking the training each quarter, and we encourage you to sign up. The next slide is entitled CMS ICD-10 Website, and we have a picture of that screen, and we have highlighted the, on the left-hand side, the different um, pieces of information that you can easily access by clicking on the link. This website is dedicated to ICD-10. The address is www.cms.gov slash ICD-10. This is the central location of all CMS materials concerning ICD-10. The links on the left side of the screen are broken into different categories of information, such as provider, payers, and vendors, to name a few. You can also sign up to receive ICD-10 email updates, as well as alerts when new information is posted on the latest news page. In a difference, there is information on the general equivalency mappings, and the ICD-9 Coordination and Maintenance Committee can be found here. Over 108,000 people have signed up for the email update, so we encourage you to please use this resource that is available. Also available on our CMS ICD-10 website are implementation guides. CMS has developed implementation guides that are tailored to the various audiences, including small and large providers, small animals, and payers. The implementation guides include planning, communication, assessment, implementation, testing, and transition recommendations. 
We are also developing an online ICD-10 implementation guide. The online implementation guides will provide stakeholders with a quick, easy way to access the implementation materials. Stakeholders can click through the information to find the most relevant information. The online implementation guide table of contents will highlight the key ICD-10 implementation steps in activities, including planning, community awareness, assessment, implementation, testing, and transition. The next couple of slides, we talk about the ICD-10 resources, and we provide links to each piece of those, um, each resource that we have listed. There is a wealth of ICD-10 resources available to the public, and new information is being updated and added on a regular basis. The CMS ICD-10 website contains materials to help industry with implementation, as well as ICD-9 to ICD-10 mapping information. Other resources include materials that are shared in various formats, including national provider calls, information on net termi terminations, and the education information generated from the Medicare Learning Network. Our next slide is entitled Health Condition Categories. The top 30 health conditions that are key to state Medicaid agency business and analysts are identified on this slide. State Medicaid agencies, through a multidisciplinary team, defined each health condition so that there was clarity on the intent of what is or is not to be included in the category. ICD-9 codes and ICD-10 codes were mapped to each category based on this definition. CMS is also reaching out to industry groups to share and request a review of the health conditions. After validation, all category definitions and mappings will be made available on the state Medicaid Agency's ICD-10 collaboration site. The next slide speaks about the state Medicaid Agency's ICD-10 collaboration site. The state Medicaid Agency ICD-10 collaboration site provides the states with a single reference point where relevant information is available and where they can share information with their counterparts. The collaboration site includes updates on important state Medicaid agency events, educational and support materials and resources, and a community for state Medicaid agency best practices and lessons learned. Technical assistance and training. On this, um, web, on this slide, we have a CMS IC10 technical assistance to state. So it's a map of the U.S. with a key code and highlights. The map shows the on-site training sessions that the Center for Medicaid, CHIP, and Survey and Certifications Department has provided for the states. CMS has visited 36 states to provide technical assistance and has conducted 11 policy remediation workshops. The Center for Medicaid, CHIP, and Survey and Certification has two additional training sessions that are scheduled for the future. The next slide is entitled SMA ICD-10 Technical Assistance and Training. CMS has conducted regional office workshop visits as well as 36 state site visits and 11 policy remediation site visits. The state Medicaid agency's training modules include ICD-10 overview, code structure and definition, information on GEMS and translation and dual processing, claims management, managed care, analytics and reporting, program integrity, and provider communication. The state Medicaid agency site has training content. On this slide, we show our two of the 250 slides that make up the ICD-10 State Medicaid Agency Site Visit training content. 
In the two examples that we provide in the presentation, one concentrates on the key business reasons why state Medicaid agencies need to focus and prepare for ICD-10, and the other highlights the related impact ICD-10 will have on the state Medicaid agency core business functions. And again, both of those slides are presented on the slide in the presentation. The ICD-10 state Medicaid agency also has an implementation handbook. The ICD-10 state Medicaid agency's implementation is, is strictly developed for state Medicaid agencies and provides core background information on the rationale of moving from ICD-9 to ICD-10. The key milestone activities related to ICD-10 implementation phases and the activities that must be completed in order to be compliant with ICD-10 by October 1, 2014. Our next slide is entitled, Nine Policy Briefs Show How ICD-10 Supports Healthcare Transformation. The first four policy briefs listed here are complete and have been shared with the state Medicaid agencies, and there is a picture of each of those policies. The other five briefs are being, are being developed. Each policy brief provides an in-depth look at a specific condition or topic, and it examines how the change to ICD-10 coding will impact state Medicaid agency programs for that condition. The policy brief ties in other healthcare initiatives that the states will need to address in addition to ICD-10. On the last slide, it includes um, a CMS point of contact, and for this pr presentation, it is myself, Renee Richard, and my email is renee.richard at cms.hhs.gov. Also, um, before we start, start with questions, the last slide of the pr presentation provides an ICD-10 questions mailbox. And providers and those on the call should feel free to use this if we are not able to get to your question today or perhaps you think of a question in the future. And that email link is icd10questions at noblis, N -O -B -L -I -S, dot org. Again, that is icd10questions at noblis, N-O-B-L-I-S dot org. That concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. Your first question comes from the line of Barbara Horrigan with Dr. Peter Von Kors office. Your line is now open. Hi. Thank you, Renee. Um, I would like to know, is this course going to be given again, and how do we get the, uh, the different uh, slide, slides that we were not able to see? Um, I, I think I would have gotten more out of this if I was able to see the slide. Hi. I, I absolutely agree, and I apologize. There is a file share box. Can, um, are you able to see that? where you can download the presentation? I see it, and I have hit save to my computer, and nothing happens. Okay. Um, what you can do if you want, um, let me give you my email address again. You can contact me, and I can send you the presentation. We do have um, two other webinars that we're giving today. Um, they may be full, but um, I will definitely take um, this into consideration and talk to the other folks about perhaps presenting it again since we did have te technical difficulties. Okay. And so your my email? E my email is Renee, R E N E E, dot Richard, R I C H A R D, at C M F dot H H S dot G O V. Okay. Hello, this is also uh, Denicia Green uh, with CMS, and one of the things we can think about doing is posting um, the PowerPoint presentation to our website as well, if that will be helpful. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Your next question comes from the line of Eleanor Miller with the Center for Orthopedics. Now open, now open. Oh, no, I was going to ask for that as well as the last person since I couldn't download it either. But okay, if it's going to be up on the website, that'll be fine. Okay, and just to, um, in addition to that, today's webinar will be recorded, and both the audio portion and slides will be made available. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I'm not sure exactly sure of the date, but um, please be looking for that as well on the ICD-10 website. Okay. Your next question comes from the line of Carol Schist. Please state your organization. Your line is now open. Uh, Dr. Norman Tarowski. Now you said it's going to be on. Right, is, right, is it going to be on the, like the main page? Because you know, I can't download these things either. And how big is the ICD-10 book going to be compared to the ICD-9? Yes, hi, this is Denicia, and um, just some clarification on that. Are you talking about the um, the guide, the implementation guide? Well, what we missed today because we about could not see the code see, book. Well, both. The code book. Okay. I mean, compared to the ICD-9 book that we have now, I mean, because of all, there's going to be a lot more codes. Now, is this going to sure. be like a huge book? Mm -hmm. So what we were talking about in the presentation, and apologies that there were some tech technical difficulties, um, is we have a book, book, book um, that helps to um, helps providers, um, hospitals, and, and others to navigate ICD-10 implementation. Mm -hmm. And so it's an A through Z guide on sort of the how-to, um, how to get started, um, how to um, – sort of catch up if you're behind, what are the major steps and milestones that you need to t to take and achieve um, as you move towards compliance. Right. Um, and so what we'll do, um, we will work on getting these slides up for you all so that you all can have access to it. And I would imagine that you would have additional questions after having an opportunity to review it. Um, in, a, in addition to what she mentioned, um, the audio will be um, also included with the slide so that you can through and through and uh, get a sense of uh, the presentation today. Now, has the ICD-10 book been published yet? Yes, there there is an ICD-10 book. Okay. Mm -hmm. Compared to the ICD-9, I mean, is it like twice the size because there's so many more codes? It is more codes. Um, it is a, a book that you would need to purchase. Um, CMS does not um, develop that that book, but, okay. but we we absolutely have the guidebook um, available available for everyone. It's an online tool. We're also finding that many providers um, are wanting to have something more useful and sort of hands on. Um, our guides right now range uh, from from about 60, and so it's. It's a very helpful guide for getting you there, and you may just want to pull pieces out of it, um, depending on which step of implementation that you're in. Um, so what we're what we're doing right now is pulling key pieces of that document and creating some checklists and fact sheets. Great. Um, so it would be a helpful aid that you have right there at your your desk or location to kind of help you walk through and talk to others uh, at your office. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if it would be helpful for us to share some of those sort of key links, um, I know that many of them are in the presentation, but uh, we can certainly share them uh, while we're putting that up on the website. Your next question comes from the line of Elia Ann with the Suffolk Anesthesiology Associates. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Um, I might have missed uh the link I did I was able to download the presentation so I did follow along but uh, I'm looking for the web address for the um, state Medicaid agency's ICD-10 collaboration site was that in one of your slides uh, well we we shared the information about the state collaboration site um, we, we did not share the, the uh, link, link itself because it is um, 
specific to Medicaid agencies. Right. Okay. That's and we do, my thought. But. Yes, and we do have a form for them, and the intent there is to get some best practices and lessons learned being shared across the state Medicaid agencies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is a definite form from, for them, but what we're doing is we're looking at what are some of the key things that they're finding, what are some of the lessons learned, and we're pulling that information out and planning to share that more broadly. Oh, um, you will in the future? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're and looking for those key themes that we can share across okay. the industry. That's, that's great. And the technical assistance and training map, I notice uh, we're in New York. Um, yes. I notice there is no training, no technical assistance sites available. Is that going to change? As a matter of fact, we've reached out uh, to New York um, a couple of times to get mm-hmm. training sc- scheduled um, okay. and are very much interested in doing that. Um, so that's for the state Medicaid agency itself, right. but we're also offering some additional courses and some training, which is more focused around the, pro- the provider. Um, the and how, uh, how will the provider be made aware of these sites? Because this is the first I'm hearing of this. Sure, sure. So what we're doing is we're working with um, stakeholder organizations um, to to work with them to share that with their membership. Um, if there's um, interest in something like that, we can certainly par- partner you up and pair you uh, with a group that will be giving that free training and technical assistance to. Okay, so if you're interested in that, please send that information into our um, ICD-10 um, uh, uh questions mailbox, and the we question. can certainly follow up with you. Okay. Yes. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. This question comes from the line of Terry Kelly with Ocean Medical Center. Your line is now open. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I did. I was able to download the presentation before you started having issues. I'm just not seeing the slide numbers anywhere on the presentation. Am I just missing them? You were When you were mentioning, you know, refer to slide so-and-so, I really couldn't follow because I'm not seeing the numbers on here. Hello? Hi, um, this is Renee. I apologize for that. I realize um, that is the case. I guess I saw them because I, when I typically, when I have a presentation, I printed it out as um, you the notes. Okay. So the numbers were in there, but we'll definitely um, update the presentation to include the slide, the slide numbers, and we apologize. And then my other question is, you had mentioned that physicians can earn CME credits for taking the training. Is that somewhere in this presentation? Because I want to bring that back to our physician liaison so they can go out and start like kind of promoting this. Absolutely. Um, if you go to our ICD-10 website, you can actually pick up the information about training there, okay. um, and that is detailed on the website, and we're encouraging everyone to use it. It's been very popular, um, and so uh, anyone can take the training, and mm-hmm. it's nurses, staff, um, you name it, mm-hmm. but only physicians will earn the CMEs, and we're also looking into exploring um, offering CNA credits as well down the line. Is there going to be um, um, notification going out to providers that participate with Medicare that this is available to them? Or are you relying on us as the hospital to to let them know that? (laughs) Well, you know, this this is really an implementation um, where we're going to all have to come together. So Mm -hmm. absolutely share that information with your providers. Um, We are and have been sharing that broadly. Um, Right now we have about 16,000 people taking the training each quarter. We'd like to increase that number. So absolutely please share that information. It would be wonderful. And it is on www.cms.gov slash ICD-10, and then there's there's something for training that I click on? Uh, Yeah, so you would go under provider resources. Okay. Okay. And it's 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 right in there. Um, there, as a matter of fact, there's a great number of fact sheets, resources, and that's the one thing about our website that I do like is that you can identify, you know, if I'm a payer, if I'm a provider, where mm-hmm. do I go? And it's a section, and it gives you everything you need um, if you're a provider, everything if you're a payer. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. 
Your next question comes from the line of Anthony Carbone. Please state your organization. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, I'm with National Government Services. Hi, Denise and Renee. I understand your uh, issues with the uh, presentation. I do presentations as well, and it does happen. Um, my question is, uh, I'm still downloading this presentation. I know you gave me your address to email to get that. But uh, my question is, um, with ICD-10 and 5010 implementation for electronic billing, I'm sure you guys are going to be doing also electronic ICD-10 sessions in the future. Yes, you know, we're we're really looking for um, innovative ways to get this message out, and um, would like to get some input and feedback to that. Um, we have heard that many um, uh, physicians and other professionals are, are extremely busy during the day, and having those uh, modules online sometimes works best. Um, so we're trying to give training, training and, and the information in a couple different formats. Um, but, yes, please send those suggestions in. Okay. And as far as the ICD-10 booklet, one of the uh, people on the call was asking about, you know, the book being tremendously big. I would assume that this would also be on the CD-ROM. The ICD-10 booklet can be purchased, I would think, from an ICD-ROM, and then they can print out what they need off the CD because of the volume well, of the booklet. Yeah, it, well, it's not um, it's not in CD-ROM right now. Um, I will say that you can go in right now and print a portion of the, the book um, as you need it. it. It is separated out into specific areas and uh, specific sections. Um, so it's not, like, it's not like if you hit a print and it prints out all 60 pages, you can actually go to the section that you're most interested in right now and print out that section. All right. I want and to we thank are Sure, and I just wanted to, to add another comment to that. Um, we are taking the, the booklet itself and developing an online tool to break it down even further. So um, thank you. No, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Robert Ratchet with Middleborough Chiropractic. Your line is now open. Hi, ladies. How are you today? Wonderful. How are you? Great. Actually, most of my questions that have been answered, uh, I tried to get the question to come off, but uh, they, I still it's still in the queue. Uh, my biggest question was the download. No problem. And again, we we apologize for the technical uh, difficulties today, but you know it was our intent to really have a conversation with you all to make sure that you had some of the key pieces um, in implementing ICD-10. We will ensure that this uh, PowerPoint presentation is made available to each and every one of you, and we would just want to thank you for taking the time out today. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Robert. If you could state your full name and organization, your line is now open. Robert, your line is now open. If you've queued up for a question. Your next question comes from the line of Holly Brocco with the Jewish Physician Group. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi. Uh, we were just wondering um, if you know how this will impact uh, work comp and, say, auto claims? Sure. Um, so those organizations are not considered covered entities. Um, and so um, uh, the ICD-10 uh, uh, requirement is for covered entities. And so um, we've been talking a lot with um, other payers and plans, and it really is a business decision as to how each plan or payer would like to reams from, reams from those organizations. Uh, for Medicare um, or for CMS, we're requiring it to be an ICD-10 format, um, depending on you know date of service, date of discharge, um, but. You know, it, it it is a question of um, how plans are planning to uh, take that information in. Uh, we have had some preliminary calls with some plans, and um, many are are doing the same thing, requiring a 10. But please check in with your uh, uh, 
care and health plans. Okay, so it's so it's it's up to the physician practice then to just kind of reach out to the payers in their region to determine yes. what they're going to be accepting. Yes. Okay, so this I guess I you know with ICD-10 being such a big deal, and I know that this is something CMS is doing, but I guess I had the impression that this was something that was required. So you're saying that payers have an option, so Anthem could say, well, we don't want to do ICD-10, so we're going to stick with ICD-9. Is that what you're oh, saying? No, so let me clarify that. So for um, there are a couple of entities, and very limited, that are non-covered entities. Okay. Um, ICD-10 affects payers, providers, clearinghouses, um, you name it. And so it's ICD-10 moving forward. However, there are small, limited amount of groups um, and types of claims like workers' compensation, auto, auto, property and casualty, and some other types of um, unique cases that are not covered entities. And so those organizations um, don't have to provide an ICD-10 claim. However, um, we are hearing from many providers and payers, many payers, that um, because of their business rules, they will require that as part of reimbursement. So it is a question of if you're if you fall into that very limited, very unique case, then you would need to check in with your payer to see how they plan to process that payment. For for CMS, and um, we are requiring an ICD-10 code to come through, and that and that would be based on the date of service or date of discharge. Okay, uh, and I understand that. I guess I guess I was a little confused when you said that there are payers that could determine if they were going to accept it or not. So you're just saying that there are certain cl limited classes such as work comp, auto, and maybe yes. all payers. I don't know really know what you mean by that, but is there is there there's not really a list of any classifications per se that we can look up somewhere as a reference of you know these aren't necessarily required to comply with ICD-10? Because it's kind of It's, it's kinda auto big. claims, it's, it's workers' comp claims, those sorts of things. But, okay. you know, it sounds like um, this may be a, a, a topic for maybe some additional clarification around that. Well, because um, it makes a big difference, you know, from an operational perspective. And if you take orthopedics, for example, you know, you've got a physician in the practice that sees a lot of work comp, likely, and then they probably see a lot of Medicare, too, or, or non-work comp cases, so it's kind of like, from an operational sense, there's got to be a workflow put into place for, okay, now I'm in ICD-9 mode, and now I'm in ICD-10 mode. It can be very confusing, so I, yeah, well, let I think, me, yeah. Sure, let me, let me add a little to that, um, if this will be helpful. Um, so, ICD-9 versus ICD-10, um, Medicare has issued uh, uh, guidelines on uh, payment um, and, and how those things should be billed. Um, and so you'll see that on our, our CMS website, and we can certainly share some additional information around that. I know much information has gone out um, over the last few weeks to ensure that um, it's the message is really getting out across the industry. Um, but whether you use an ICD-9 or ICD-10 is still based on the date of service or date of discharge. Um, so um, in this case, if the group is supposed to be using a 9, and that would be a 9 code, and that would be prior anything prior to October 1st, um, 2014, then that's fine, and that applies to Okay. Um, if it's if it's a claim that is um, if it's a, a date of service that is after October 1, 2014, then it should be an ICD-10 code. In the unique case here, you have a non-covered entity, a non-covered um, claim, and so, for example, you have an auto workers; they are not required to use ICD-10 in that case. However, 
in order to get paid for that claim, the payer may require them to submit it in that format. And that can be the case. And so absolutely, they should check in with their uh, payers or health plan to see how they're going to process that individual claim. Um, for Medicare, I think we've been clear as to how we would process those, um, and it would, again would be based on that date of service or date of discharge. Um, and if it's before October 1, 2014, it's going to be a nine. And if it's afterwards, it's going to be on or after, it's going to be an ICD-10 code. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Does that does that help to clarify somewhat? And yeah, is there I mean, a need for any need additional? Sure, but it was just the whole, you know, the ones that I guess aren't following ICD-10, and so we'll have to just kind of drill down and get sure. to those individual work comp carriers, I guess, and figure out what we need to do. So thank yes. you very much. Sure. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Christy Stillion with Westfield Fire Department. Your line is now open. Good morning. Um, I have I do have a question, but I also have a comment for the people who are having issues saving um, the presentation to the computer. I did at first in that file share box. I don't know if anyone has tried. You have to select on the um, document stating Eastern Event RO ICD-10 presentation, then hit save to your computer. Once I did that, there was no problem. It did take a very long time to download, though, however. It took a good five, ten minutes to get, to get it to work. Okay. Um, my you question, that. you're welcome. I, I don't know if it, once you hit on that Eastern event, it turns to yellow, and then the save to my computer box lights, lights, or, or it goes into bold, and then you're able to save it. So I don't know if that's part of the issues that some of the people were having. Um, my question regarding ICD-10 comes um, on the basis of providing ambulance transports. What does the EMT documentation, how does, is there, does there need to be any changes as to how they document in order to process claims to the insurance um, carriers? How does ICD-10 affect ambulance? Mm -hmm. Well, the, 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 the general answer to that is, um, and, and I guess this would go across the board, is your documentation should uh, be able to support the ICD-10 codes in uh, with the, the greater specificity in the code. Um, there will be a need to um, ensure that your documentation is reflective of that. So they have to be specific as in if we pick someone up for leg pain, it needs to be um, left leg versus right leg. And um, going through past Medicare um, webinars and conferences, they also talk about first event, second event, past, you know, past history. Our EMTs have to do document all that? Well, any claim that's coming through would, would of course, require the um, documentation um, that would would be needed to support that your diagnosis code. Uh, um, for ICD-9, you're, you're doing that now. Um, you're supporting your code, and so um, your diagnosis code, and that would be the same for ICD-10, that you okay. would need the documentation available to support your diagnosis for ICD-10 as well. Okay. Because I know, like, there's general, you know, there is leg pain in ICD-9, but of my understanding in the ICD-10, um, they're more specific as to what leg and upper leg, lower leg. It's, like, very specific. On the ICD-10 CMS website, is there any area specifically that I can go for help regarding with ambulance that I can bring to the EMT? We'll certainly take a look and see if we have anything to address you. What I'll ask you to do is send in your question to the ICD-10 questions mailbox, and we'll follow up with you um, offline. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hi. Um, this is Renee again. Um, it seems we've come to the end of our presentation. Would like to thank you all for participating in the ICD-10 webinar today. Um, hopefully, everybody can access the presentation slides that are available in the file share. 
If not, as we said, we will be posting them on our website as well as um, providing a recording and audio of this presentation. So again, we'd like to thank everyone and have a great day.